on the streets of Alma, and people were pretty excited. And they kept uh, tweaking it and reinventing it, and they kept making new models until they had a truck that worked pretty well. And then the next year, they decided to change the name of the company from the Alma Truck Company to the Republic Truck Company. And by that time, they had what people regarded as a, a pretty good saleable truck. And they continued in 1913, 14, 15 to come out with new models, new improved models, and uh, put a plant up along Bridge Street where the pontoon boat company is now, plant number one. They didn't know it was going to be one. The Republic truck, as with the truck companies in, well, St. Louis had one briefly, um, but in Mount Pleasant, and I know Greenville, maybe Ithaca, St. John's, they all had truck companies. They simply assembled trucks from parts that they ordered from suppliers. And so if you wanted an engine, you might uh, make a deal with, I don't know, Continental or something to supply your engine. Not a lot of the parts apparently were made in Elma, but the truck that they designed and put together was a good product. And so it began to grow and uh, people in Elma got a little excited about it. Well, in, what was it, 1917, we entered uh, World War I, the Great War, and the government said, we need trucks to be shipped over to France. And they looked around and said, Republic Truck makes a good product, and they gave Republic Truck huge government orders. And uh, suddenly the company couldn't keep up. There was no way they could do it. Now, before long, they had a workforce of a couple thousand men. And there were not places to live in Alma. Every available bit of housing was taken. Some people even lived in tents off the east side of Alma, not too far from the plant. Well, obviously, the overflow came to St. Louis. And so every available place to live in St. Louis was taken. And they ran a bus, a jitney, with a bus wagon on the back, back and forth on Michigan Avenue, day after day after day, moving the St. Louis workers to and from the plant. Some of the early investors in Republic Truck became very wealthy. And after the war was over, there was a sharp depression, and that hurt sales. And then there was a lot of competition. And some of the bigger companies, like Ford, were also producing trucks. And by the time that uh, everybody was producing trucks, Republic was in trouble. And over the course of the 1920s, it went downhill, it was bought by La France. La France Republic was bought by Sterling and uh, basically Republic Truck ceased to exist. <clears throat> but Sterling, uh, Republic Truck was remarkable in that right from the start it had a good sales staff, it had uh, great distribution, it had good dealerships, it had uh, good uh, parts depots, and it spread all over, not just the United States. There are people in Germany with Republic Trucks, there are people in Australia with Republic Trucks, and I have a picture of the dealership in Adelaide, Australia. So Republic Truck, by 1920, was the largest single manufacturer of trucks in the United States, if not in the world. And from then on, sad to say, it was downhill. Well, Alma has a Republic Truck, and St. Louis has a Republic Truck, and anywhere that uh, people have Republic Trucks, they're very proud of them, and they try to restore them as authentically as they can. So this Republic truck, this particular model, is fairly rare, as Rudy explained, and so we can be very proud to have this particular model of the Republic truck. Well, I hope with a, a review of the Red Susan and the Plank Road, the coming of the railroad and the depots and the Republic truck, this will give all of us a little greater appreciation of some of the very rare holdings of the St. Louis Historical Society which is definitely a major part of St. Louis. Uh, thank you for your attention. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Dave. Um, Gary, would you get the mid-statesmen? You know where they are. They're rehearsing over on Franklin Street. We are ready for them at this time. Uh, we're about to be entertained by uh, one of my favorite types of entertainment, barbershop quartet and it, they just seem to fit into the into the program today when we started planning the activities um, there's there's a lot going on and while we're waiting for them I want to take time to, to thank the mid statesmen for showing up today 
Margaret Metcalf, the third graders, uh, Dave McMack, and our keynote speaker. And especially thank uh, our board of directors, our officers that put this together, the other volunteers that helped, and those that made donations to make today possible. So we we're going to have uh, quite some entertainment here. We've got uh, these fellows in the teal shirts coming around the corner, and there's more than I anticipated. So we're, we're in for a special treat. And then after the uh, presentation by the mid-statesman, uh, I've got just a couple more quick words to say. We'll do the dedication of the house. And then uh, everybody's free to roam and look at the exhibits and some of these just marvelous treasures that we have here. Yes, it is. Uh, <coughs> well, there's no return. 